Last week, I released a video about a recent Republican Party talking point and movement called Defund the FBI. The movement is not actually designed to remove funding from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Instead, it exists to distract from the Donald Trump investigation related to obstruction of justice and the Espionage Act. It aims to delegitimize the investigation, to label it a witch hunt, in order to exonerate the possible 2024 presidential candidate. It's also a pretense for the Republican Party to potentially exert even greater control over the FBI should they come into power again. The defund part is not a policy proposal. It's a meme. <laughs> it's designed to mock the 2020 activist rallying cry, defund the police. To this day, people do not understand the actual proposals of defund the police, nor do they recognize that not much, if anything, was actually accomplished to institute those proposals. You wouldn't know that if you watch Fox News or other conservative media because they want to convince you that the police were defunded and that has resulted in a crime wave. The truth, of course, is a lot more complicated, more nuanced, and a far cry from what is claimed by talking heads like Tucker Carlson. Misinformation in 2022 is rampant, and I want to do my part to debunk some myths and dishonest talking points. So let's dive into it, and maybe we can all learn something today. Defund the Police describes a series of policy proposals to significantly reform and reorganize modern policing. The defund part is only one step in a series of institutional changes, funding reallocation, and the creation of substitute services. In its current form, the modern centralized police is not preventative. The police generally do not prevent crime. The police respond to crime. There is precious little evidence that suggests that police surveillance and police presence significantly impact crime. Those who advocate for defund the police policy proposals believe that reallocating funds towards preventative measures makes a lot more sense. Research shows that criminogenic conditions, the circumstances that create crime, can be better resolved through equity in education, infrastructure, and the reduction of poverty through public housing, universal health care, greater resources for the unhoused, and drug rehabilitation. Some crimes are not the direct results of these social problems, but many are. To put more simply, Endlessly funding an increasingly militarized police force has a limited effect on crime because it is reactive, not preventative, and does not address criminogenic conditions. Standing up to a cherished institution in the United States, like the police, is a lightning rod for controversy and outrage. Politicians, by nature, prefer to play it safe. There's an election coming soon, and another one, and another one. In addition to this, resolving criminogenic conditions does not benefit the corporate interests that donate to politicians. Eliminating poverty would give greater bargaining power to the workers, forcing a sizable increase in wages, strengthening union power, and reducing income inequality to the point that capitalists would have less control over its employees, less control over the population. Resolving criminogenic conditions is in the best interests of society and humanity, but it's not in the best interests of the people with all the power, the people with all the money, and the people who make all the decisions. And that's why it doesn't happen. Advocates for defund the police policy proposals also want to create substitutes for certain emergencies. The police respond to a number of emergencies, many of which are outside their area of expertise or ability to contain. For example, when someone is having a mental health emergency, the police are dispatched to resolve this emergency, often with catastrophic consequences. A police officer is not a social worker or a psychiatrist. A mental health counselor could be dispatched instead. For another example, when there is a dispute between two people that has not yet turned violent, the police are dispatched to resolve the dispute. A conflict mediator could be dispatched instead. The police cannot be expected to resolve every conflict with a gun. It's a cliche, but when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Police training varies, but on average, prospective officers in the United States train at a police academy somewhere between 13 and 19 weeks, basically four or five months. Police academy training focuses heavily on protecting the officer more than protecting those at the scene of the crime. By comparison, social workers generally have college degrees, often advanced degrees, and their training is almost exclusively about protecting others. 
defunding the police and reallocating funds to other public services would actually be beneficial to police departments in the long run as well because less overall crime would result in fewer instances of police officers injured or killed in the line of duty. Fewer instances of police shootings and police brutality would result in fewer riots that erupt when communities witness injustice. Less fear of police would result in greater community cooperation against common foes, like violent gangs, and it would go a long way toward reducing the detrimental psychological toll of being a police officer in the first place. In short, defund the police does not mean simple budget cuts or randomly taking money out of local law enforcement. It's part of a broader public safety initiative with specific goals and specific actions to achieve these goals. So how far did defund the police actually get? Basically, nowhere. It got the most traction in Minneapolis due to the police department's responsibility in the murder of George Floyd. There were some members of the city council who did propose dismantling the police and replacing many of their responsibilities. However, the mayor rejected this outright. There was a small cut to police funding and reallocation to other public safety systems in 2020, but this was restored in 2021. Almost nothing was allowed to happen. New York did cut some of its funding, but not in the way that defund the police activists wanted. They reassigned some officers, shifted a handful of responsibilities, saved some money, but the size of the force remained the same. In 2021, New York elected a police officer as the new mayor who promised to expand the police. There were some significant cuts in Austin, Texas and Des Moines, Iowa, but the funds were not reallocated to replace police responsibilities in any meaningful way. In other words, the actual goals of the defund the police movement were not accomplished or even attempted because a simple cut is not what defund the police really means. A smattering of barely known local Democratic politicians may have supported the notion, if not the practice, but prominent Democrats avoided the talking point like the plague or rejected it in public. Joe Biden campaigned against defunding. I'm the only one who's talked about increasing police budgets. Bernie Sanders, who is an independent but caucuses with the Democrats and runs as a Democrat for president, wanted no part of it and actively denounced it. Who supported it? Some, but not all, of the so-called squad. Basically, a few of the newer congresswomen with no real power more or less endorsed it, and that's it. The defund the police movement did not originate within the Democratic Party, nor was it popularized by the Democratic Party. It was popularized in late May 2020 by the Black Visions Collective, a black liberation organization in Minnesota. It spread on social media and within activist circles. During a private conference call on June 8, 2020, Democratic leaders conspired to distance the party from the movement. The term defund the police was popularized as May turned to June. Mere days later, the Democratic Party leadership decided against it. There is this selectively edited video floating around allegedly showing top Democrats saying defund the police, but it's not that. In the video, Nancy Pelosi says in a completely non-committal way that maybe perhaps shuffle some money around, which is basically saying nothing. It also has Kamala Harris supporting New York Democrats' aforementioned limited efforts, but again, these efforts were not designed around the true goals of the movement, so she wasn't really saying that either. Almost nobody was, not really. The Democratic Party ran away from the movement from the very beginning. What did we expect? Their politics do not align with the goals of the movement. And they are, you know, cowards. For their cowardice, they were not repaid, because Republicans still try to attach the movement to the Democratic Party to this day. The facts don't matter. It was never a mainstream talking point in the Democratic Party, never an adopted policy position, and never truly endorsed by the leaders of the party. Joe Biden went as hard as possible against it during the most recent State of the Union. We should all agree the answer is not to defund the police, it's to fund the police. Fund them. Fund them. Nothing really happened because you can't count on the Democrats to do anything cool. 
Every time there is some disaster that the police do not solve, Republicans pretend that the police actually have been defunded by the Democrats in so-called Democrat cities. Fox News is inundated with this talking point. Trouble in Detroit? Well, this is what happens when you defund the police. Rising murder rate in Chicago? Well, perhaps they would be faring better if they hadn't defunded the police. Protests in New York? The city has been burned down, and it's all because Democrats defunded the police. Except nobody did. Nobody really defunded the police, and no cities were burned down. Arson on structures did increase in 2020, but not by much. According to the FBI statistics, in 2019, the year prior, arson on structures totaled 14,026 nationwide. In 2020, the year of the so-called burned down cities, it was 15,079, an increase of only 7.5%. Fires do not equal burned down cities, and the increase is not the sole responsibility of the riots anyway. There were burglaries and thefts during the riots in 2020, but these were not widespread. In fact, in 2020, burglaries dropped 7.4% and larceny thefts dropped 10.6%. Incidents of looting and fires sensationalized on right-wing cable news do not equal a nationwide looting spree or a single burned-down city. Now, violent crime did rise during 2020 and 2021, but not because of riots or lack of police protection. Violent crime rose largely because of the pandemic, which fostered significant economic downturn, social instability of our radically altered lives, traumatic psychological damage, personal loss, increased gun ownership due to paranoia, and overworked, understaffed hospitals that could not save victims of violent crime as effectively. Attempted murders became murders more often simply due to lack of resources. That's why the numbers look the way they do. Right-wing media loves to tell you that cities were razed to the ground and everyone lost their shirt, but arson went up a tiny bit, burglaries and theft went down a tiny bit, violent crime went up due to unrelated circumstances, and that's it. More to the point, none of this was the result of defunding anything. Even the mild reforms that were passed in a handful of so-called Democrat cities were actually not responsible for the rise in some crimes in those cities. According to research by the Brennan Center for Justice, despite politicized claims that this rise was the result of criminal justice reform in liberal-leaning jurisdictions, murders rose roughly equally in cities run by Republicans and cities run by Democrats so-called red states, actually saw some of the highest murder rates of all. This data makes it difficult to pin recent trends on local policy shifts. It's 2022, and opponents of defunding the police continue to claim that it would never have worked the way activists wanted. But we will never know, because it largely did not happen. So, why didn't it happen? Some have tried to argue that the biggest problem with defund the police as a policy proposal is simply the name, that it's just bad branding of sorts. I do not agree with this at all, but let's examine this if only to debunk it. Defund the police immediately communicates the first potential major action of the policy, but it also leaves itself open to misunderstanding or even willful mischaracterization. But is that it? Is that why it didn't catch on? That seems doubtful. Any policy proposal or political position boiled down to its bare basics has that potential. For example, if someone were to characterize themselves as pro-choice, their opponents would, and do, respond, it's a child, not a choice, or use the word choice to describe unrelated policy proposals and political positions common among people with those social politics. Pro-choice, huh? They say. What about my choice to deny services to same-sex couples? As if the mere word choice meaningfully connects these positions and proves some sort of hypocrisy. Here's actor Kevin Sorbo saying, presumably with a straight face, so my body my choice, except for when it comes to student loan debt. Jesus Christ, there is no meaningful connection here, Hercules. Comparatively, if people were to characterize themselves as pro-life, their opponents would, and do, respond, if you care so much about life, why don't you advocate for gun control? This might make for good rhetoric, but the connection is tangential at best. Also, some people are pro-choice and homophobic, and some people are pro-life, 
and hate guns. Now, these two opposing terms, pro-life and pro-choice, are designed to be the most innocuous and innocent-sounding as possible, but they are nonetheless taken apart and inflamed, often using the innocuous wording. Furthermore, when people on opposing sides of a political issue or two different political parties use completely different terms for the same topic, it does not necessarily win over the other side or force the other side to adopt their language. For example, when debating immigration, Democrats have adopted the term undocumented immigrants, whereas Republicans almost exclusively use the term illegal immigrants, and neither side has convinced the other to use the opposing term. If advocates for defund the police called it reallocate community funding instead, opponents would respond, the police are part of the community, the police protect the community, you can't have a community without a powerful police force. Also, it's hard to get activists and voters motivated by a policy proposal that sounds like corporate doublespeak. In short, choosing a less incendiary name for defund the police would not necessarily reduce its opposition. If its advocates called it reallocate community funding instead, its opponents would use a different, stronger term to denounce it. You know, like defund the police or something. They would say, oh, you just want to reallocate community funding, huh? We all know what that means. You want to defund the police, and that's what we should call it. The problem with getting defund the police off the launch pad was not its name. That's just an excuse made by political figures who did not want to endorse it in the first place. The reason that defunding the police did not catch on in mainstream American politics is because it did not have enough mainstream political advocates. It is a policy proposal to the left of the Democratic Party, and the United States does not have a political party to its left, at least not one that's mainstream. Leftist politics were marginalized in the United States in the 20th century, and this has continued well into the 21st century. There is no wing that can advance the cause. There are two major political parties to oppose the cause. If the Republican Party is completely against it, and the Democratic Party is almost completely against it, who is going to pass it into law again? The Democratic Party is not going to suddenly adopt an ideology of social democracy, socialism, communism, or anarchism overnight, or ever for that matter. I'll say it again, you can't expect the Democratic Party to do anything cool. Well, I thank you for your question, uh, but I have to say we're capitalist, and that's just the way it is. The people who came closest to making this happen are the very people that both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party denounced rioters. Sometimes, the only way to make a revolutionary change is a revolution, but we got caught up in trying to maintain good optics. We wanted to force the issue, but didn't force it enough. The revolutionary potential was squandered. I'm not blaming the rioters because we didn't make something happen. I'm saying we didn't have enough rioters to make it happen. Both the phrase defund the police and the policy proposals related to the phrase should not be confused with abolish the police. Defund the police is not a radical proposal. It is a middle ground or compromise between the status quo and an actual radical revolutionary proposal. Let's sum up. Defund the police is not about making our cities less safe. It's about making our cities more safe not just through some decrease in police, but an increase in what people really need. The policy goals of defund the police were not instituted in any meaningful way, and therefore not responsible for shifts in crime rate in 2020. Decrease or increase cannot be attributed to policy goals that were not achieved in the first place. The Democratic Party did not endorse the actual defund the police policy goals, and no amount of selectively edited social media posts can change that. To clarify, I am not defending the Democratic Party here. I wanted them to side with the movement, but they did not. And the odds of them doing so without tremendous public pressure were always slim. I'm not defending the Democratic Party's decision. I'm just defending the truth. In an age of misinformation, the truth is a precious commodity. Hi everybody. If you like what I do, make sure to subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell so that you never miss an episode. 
Also, check out my Patreon link. See you soon.